مری هم جان دوربین تام خاموش کنی ممنون میشه You can start that and I'll just join with a good. Do me a favor. Give me a handy pad. So you put this on top. Now, Hitchin, do you want to start? Yes. Okay. دوستان عزیز با سلام و شب خیر خدمت همه شما عزیزان ناهید رازی هستم عضو هیئت مدیره انجمن متخصصین ایرانی در سان دیگو و خیلی خوشحالم که امشب در اولین جلسه سال 2022 میتونم میزبان شما باشم مهمان امشب ما آقای دکتر علیداد زاده هستند که محبت زیادی کردن و برای دومین بار دعوت ما را قبول کردن با استقبال خیلی زیادی که سال گذشته از صحبت هایشون و اطلاعات خیلی جامعی که در اختیار ما گذاشتن از طرف شما شد ما امسال هم به خودمون جرأت دادیم که باز از ایشون دعوت کنیم بیان و اطلاعات جدیدتر رو برای ما بگن و در مورد آینده کرونا و ما رو به اصطلاح به روز بکنن اطلاعات ما رو و خیلی ممنونیم که ایشون پذیرفتن قبل از اینکه به سخنرانی آقای دکتر زاده گوش بکنیم و به قسمت اصلی صحبتمون بریم اجازه بدید که طبق معمول من گزارش کوتاهی از فعالیت هایی رو که در یکی دو ماه گذشته انجامن انجام داده به عرضتون برسونم اولین نکته ای که باید بهتون بگم ما چهار تا از دوستای عزیزمون به عنوان عضو هیئت مدیره با انتخاب شما انتخاب شدن در دسام که به ما پیوستن در امسال و ما ورودشون رو خیر مقدم میگیم آقای حمید شقاقی و خانم ها فریبا زاکری نگار نکویی و آرزو حسین خانی هستن نکته دومی رو که میخوام خدمتون ارز کنم کمپینی هست که ما برای یک خانواده جوون ایرانی در آخر ماه دسامبر داشتیم هفته آخر دسامبر ما مطلع شدیم که یک خانواده جوون ایرانی یه پدر و مادر و بچه هشت سالشون به علت مشکلات مهاجرتی در یکی از هوملس شیلتر های سندیگو اقامت دارن که در شرایط بسیار سختی هستن به خصوص برای بچه ما همون هفته قبل از کریسمس شروع کردیم آقای سینا امامی و خانم ناهید امامی بلافاصله با اونا ملاقات کردم و ما کمپین رو شروع کردیم در عرض کمتر از پنج روز ما پنج هزار دلار براشون جمع آوری کردیم و مهمتر از اون یکی از دوستان و حامیان نیکوکار ما در شهر خونه رو در اختیارشون گذاشت با به خاطر اینکه ما بتونیم بلافاصله اینا رو از شلتر منتقل کنیم به یه خونه موقت تا اینکه مراحل قانونی رو طی بکنن و خوشبختانه ما در هفته اول ژانویه تونستیم اینا رو منتقل بکنیم به اون خونه و بچه رو مدرسه ثبت نام بکنیم و الان منتظر هستن که کار قانونیشون طی بشه من در اینجا واقعا فکر میکنم باید از همه شما همه شما که به سرعت جوابوی این نیاز فوری بودین برای یکی از هموطانانمون تشکر بکنم میدونین که ای, ای پی یک انجمن 
غیر انتفاعی هستش و ما فقط روی حق عضویت های شما و کمک و حمایت هایی که اسپانسر های ما بیزنس های در شهر میکنن روی پای خودمون ایستادیم ولی همین حضور ما باعث میشه که بتونیم همه با هم جمع بشیم و اگر نیاز فوری هست جایی برآورده بکنیم و تمام هدف ما میدونید که ارتقاء جامعه ایرانی به هر شکلی که میتونیم بنابراین ازتون خواهش میکنم به ما بپیوندید اگر هنوز عضو نیستید عضو ما بشید اگر عضو هستید و هنوز حق عضویت سال جدید رو تمدید نکردید خواهش میکنم هر چه زودتر این کارو بکنید اجازه بدید که من از سپانسر های خودمون که بیزنس های مختلف در شهر هستم و واقعا یه طیف وسیعی رو از پزشکان و دندان پزشکان و مشاورین املاک و مشاورین مالی و کلای عزیز و سولار سیستم ها و نمیدونم تعدادشون خیلی زیاده و با خصوص مواد غذایی و رستوران ها که رستوران های ما میخوام بگم تخفیف ویژه به شما میدن من وقت ندارم همه رو به خاطر کمی وقت همه رو اسمشون رو بگم ولی ازتون خواهش میکنم به وبسایت ما مراجعه کنید در صفحه اول وبسایت اسپانسرا رو ببینید و اگر به سرویس های اونا احتیاجی دارید حتما بهشون مراجعه بکنید و حمایتشون بکنید نکته آخری رو که میخوام بگم در مورد دو تا برنامه پرطرفداری که ما همیشه داشتیم و الان هم دوباره امسال ادامه میدیم یکی برنامه هپی آور ما هست که در هفته دوم هر ماه روز پنج شنبه انجام میشه و دوم هایکینگ ما هست که در هفته سوم هر ماه روز یک شنبه بنابراین ازتون دعوت میکنم که به ما بپیوندید و بهتون قول میدم که بهتون خوش بگذره با این مقدمه ما همه از آقای دکتر زاده دعوت میکنیم که سکرین رو به دست بگیرن و به سخنرانی خودشون به سخنرانی ایشون گوش میدیم خیلی ممنونم آقای دکتر بفرمایید خیلی ممنون مرسی درود بر همه با اجازه همتون من با این صحبت رو به انگلیسی انجام خواهم داد چون که در چیزایی که در مدیکال هست من راحت ترم با اینجا صحبت بکنم ولی هر سوالی داشته باشیم میتونم سوالتون رو با ایلوری بفهمم و بهتون نیزی جوابتون رو بدم و اگر نایجون بتونم من ترانسلیت بکنن بعضی موقع ها در بودی گریت well thank you it's been an honor to, add, to be asked again to do this talk uh, uh, it's uh, such a privilege to be hearing about uh, the things that you guys are doing uh, actually yesterday I, I, I did ask to become a member myself so I'm looking forward to becoming a member and hopefully a Uh, a productive one. Uh, my name is Dr. Ali Dazadeh, and uh, I just want to give it first of all a disclaimer that uh, everything I talked to you about tonight, uh, any medications I mentioned, any testings, any vaccinations, please know that I get uh, no monetary uh, benefits from any of the companies. So everything I tell you is based on, number one, uh, my opinion that is based on the studies and the guidelines. So just know that this is where it's coming from. Um, I know many people are super tired uh, of hearing about COVID, but I thought this would be a great way to talk to you guys about it because you're hearing it from someone that not just has read about COVID, but I have taken care of at least over a thousand patients that have had COVID in the last two years. Um, I've taken care of them in, in my office. I've taken care of them in nursing homes and I've taken care of them in the hospital. So I have seen this. So what you're going to hear from me is not just what is theoretically shown, but what is practically is out there. And, uh, and you'll get to, to, to hear how I feel about where we're going and uh, take that as, as what you may. So uh, let's talk, let's get started. So first, um, First slide. So where are we today? Um, so far, we've had about 70 million cases of COVID. That is a very big underestimation. And I can tell you that for a fact. There are many people that never get tested, many people that are asymptomatic, many people that have very low symptoms and they don't want to get tested. So that 70 million, is, uh, probably uh, the number is a lot higher. The most recent studies are saying at least 20% of the entire country have had COVID. 
I can tell you from personal experience, that number is much higher. Um, recently, that number was kind of peaked and we're gonna go over the numbers, how they are, how they were before and how they are today. Um, 864,000 deaths, approximately. So almost a million people have died from this. Now this number is uncertain if it's overestimated or underestimated because there may have been other reasons patient died, but they had COVID uh, at the same time and it was contributed to COVID. Or it may have been that they had COVID and they died of something and it was never discovered that they had COVID. So in reality, that number could be either overestimation or underestimation. But just keep that in mind. It's approximately around 850 to 900,000 people that have died. What is going on now, currently? Well, currently, we have about 700,000 new cases a day in the United States. 700,000. A couple of weeks ago, it was 800,000. That's when we peaked. We're on our way down, which is a great sign, okay? About 160,000 people are hospitalized right now, okay? And this is a, this is a big number. 25,000 of them are in ICU, and we have about 2,100 people dying from this every day. So it's still very serious. I hope no one at this, at this point is saying, well, it's just another flu. No, it's not another flu. It's definitely much more serious than that. But hopefully, eventually, it'll become less serious as we kind of go forward. Now, how do we protect ourselves? Well, we know it's bad. We know almost a million people died. And the only protection, really, that up to this point has really proven effective has been the vaccination. And how are we doing with vaccination? If you look over here, you notice that 251 million people in the United States have at least received one dose. And this is very recent. This is uh, as of January 24th. So 250 million people have at least received one dose. They're on their way to receiving the second dose. Because most likely in the next three to four weeks, we're going to have about 251 plus million people that are fully vaccinated. That right now, currently, we're at 63.4%. That means 63% of our entire nation is vaccinated. And, you know, for a modern country, you know, one that's a leader in the world, we're actually way low compared to some of the other countries. I'll give you an example. For example, UK is at 90 percent. Israel is over 80 percent. So we are at 63 percent. So we are really still behind. And a lot of that, you know, maybe because vaccination is no longer about science and in many cases it's about politics. And so, you know, hopefully when we're done with this talk today, we can at least get the facts. After that, everyone can make their own decisions if, if they haven't gotten vaccinated, if they can get vaccinated or not. And if they're vaccinated, should they get a booster? If you notice in the blue box here, only 84 million people have actually gotten the booster. And uh, we're going to show you today that that booster may be a very important thing for a certain population of people, not everyone. But a certain population of people, at least to my opinion, and I'll tell you, I'll give you my logic for it. So vaccinations are great, right? Uh, well, are they really effective, though? I mean, I've heard all kinds of things that vaccines don't work. Well, the answer to that question, if they're effective or not, is yes and no. And I'll show you why. First, let's look at the purple line on this slide. And you notice the purple line is the actual infection line. And you notice what happens at about 14th of December, maybe in the beginning of December, there all of a sudden there's a big drop. You guys all see this? This drop shows that the vaccines stopped being very effective against people getting infected. What that means is if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, you can still get the infection. So you're like, well, why should I get the vaccine then if there's no difference? Well, the different com difference comes in the top two lines. The yellow, the light yellow line is the hospital. The orange one is the, is the ICU. You notice, even though more and more people are getting infected, the hospitalization and ICU are staying about the same. That means people that are getting the vaccines are still being protected against the hospitalization versus uh, people that aren't. And I'm going to show you the next slide, which is very powerful. This slide was just taken out of the uh, CDC. And what it, they're looking at is what we all should care about. And it's not about 
do I want to get infected or not? Do I care about getting infected or not? That's not really as important. What's more important is, am I going to die from this infection or not? Because that's what ultimately makes, the, makes all the difference in the world. And if you notice here, the solid black line, it represents the unvaccinated. And the dotted line and the blue line on the bottom, that represents the two groups of people. One is fully vaccinated without the booster. That's the dotted line. And the solid blue line is the fully vaccinated with the booster. You notice that as we've gone through the pandemic, that line has stayed very, very low the entire time. And you notice the unvaccinated, they have a much higher risk of dying. They're always much higher on this top level. And you notice that in December, there's a big spike in the number of deaths in the unvaccinated. But even though the variants are changing, you notice this line on the bottom, the dotted line and the blue line are staying very constantly low. What that means is, yes, vaccines may have lost some effectivity against people getting the infection, but they're still doing what we initially intended for them to do, which is preventing people from dying. And if you look at the two boxes on the bottom, this is your takeaway from this slide, that if you're an unvaccinated person over the age of 18, you have 13 times higher risk of getting the infection. Okay, maybe you're like, I don't care. But the second box, which I've put a circle, red circle around, this is the one you should care about you have 68 times higher risk of dying from the COVID if you're not vaccinated. So if you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. You know, Now, I'll, I'll go through exactly the differences in all kinds of scenarios that could possibly be. But at least the answer you should get from so far as this is, hey, listen, we do have vaccines. Yes, they're not as effective anymore in preventing infection, but yes, they are still very effective in preventing death. And that is the key way. At each point along the line, I'm going to kind of stop and see if there are any questions. If there are any questions, Nigel, if you don't mind, read them for me. If not, I'll move on to the next slide. Any questions so far of what I've discussed regarding the vaccine's effectivity against the infections versus dying? No questions? I, no, I don't have Perfect. any. I don't know if you have uh, questions from our Facebook uh, right. people or other social media. Always at the end, I want to open up the Q&A anyways, and we can ask more questions. Okay. But I'll just move forward right now. Uh, now one question. we got one yeah. question. Sure. Okay, someone asked us on the previous, previous slide, the graph showed the sharp drop in infections. That is the question. Yeah, so that's a good question. It's not a drop in infections, it's a drop in protection against the infection. So what's happening is that in, because of the new variant, Omicron, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, the vaccines are not as effective in preventing infection, which means I, if I have COVID and you're vaccinated, I could still give it to you and you could still get COVID. The benefit is what this shows is even though the protection against getting infected is dropping, the protection against hospitalization and ICU admissions are staying very constant, which means if you are vaccinated, you're still protected against being hospitalized. That's what this slide shows. I hope that makes sense. There is another question. Yeah. Uh, it says that I don't know if that is actually true, that uh, they ask why Moderna vaccine is not FDA approved. Yeah, actually, we're going to get to that in a second. So that's a great question. Um, and uh, that's, those are good questions. And some of your questions, I may not know the answer, but I'll tell you what, what I can, I, I, my opinion is on those. Here, here's a very good slide. Uh, you know, we talk about herd immunity. You know, when we, be, we began this pandemic, all of us, including myself in my last talk, I said, all we need to do is get to 80% vaccination and we have herd immunity. Well, let's see if I was right. You look at this uh, two slides here. I want you to pay attention to the dates. One slide is January 21 of 2021. The other slide is also January 21, but of 2022. We're looking at last year and this year, exactly the same dates. And let's take a quick look and see how they compare. How are things, how are things then? How are things now? 
First thing you notice at that time, we had about 3 million cases. As of today, we have about 7.5 million cases in California. This is all California. This is not the United States, just California. We have 7.5 million cases. Not, that's not really important to me. Here's what is important to me. Number of daily cases. This is the blue circle right here. At that time, a year ago, we had about almost 20,000 new cases every day. As of today, what does that number turn into? 106,000. The number of new infections every day have more than five times increased. So do we have herd immunity? Even though California is over 80% vaccinated. So the idea of herd immunity is really, as I'm gonna talk about it later too, it's really not gonna happen because we are at that 80% mark. And look, we have actually more people not getting infected, but here's the benefit. Here's what's happening because 80% are, are vaccinated. You look over here, even though we only have 20,000 people every day getting, uh, getting infected and we only had 3 million cases, we had 19,000 people in the hospital versus today 15,000. And we have 4,670 people in the ICU and right now only 2,485. And this part is the most important. Look at the yellow highlight. At, on that day, there are about 570 people dying every day. Look now, 45 people dying every day. So what is happening exactly? And this is very powerful to understand that even though, even though the number of inf infections have increased tremendously, the number of deaths have decreased tremendously. The hospitalization has gone down. The ICU admissions have gone down. So this is great news. What does this tell us? That means there are multiple factors that are most likely helping us to get to this. One factor most likely is the vaccination. The other factor is the Omicron variant that's now happening, and I'll show you, I'll go over that, is most likely not as deadly. So all of this becomes important for us to actually understand, you know, where we are and where we're going. Anyone have any questions on this slide? Uh, yes, there is actually a question regarding this slide, and it says that could increase in the number of infections because now we have access to tests. That's a very good, uh, that's a very good point. Absolutely, some of that increase is because we have more access to test. Not only that, people are more willing to test. So that's definitely a possibility. But at the same time, I'll tell you, Omicron, as we'll go over it in a little bit later, is much more contagious. So it spreads much easier for many different reasons, which I'll go over in a second. So yes, part of that may be because there's more people getting the test done. But in January of last year, we still had a lot of tests at that time too. But right now it's even more available. If anyone wants to get tested, I mean, they can get tested. Now the government is even sending four free tests to each home to get tested. So in reality, the answer is uh, you're, you may be right that some of that number may be slightly inflated because of that. But the, also the other side of the coin is a lot of the people that are doing the home test now, when they turn positive, that, not, that information is not being reported to anywhere. So that can also bring the number down. So it could be an inflation because more people are testing. It could also be an underestimation because a lot of people that are testing, they're doing it on their own privacy and they're not reporting it to anyone. So we just don't know about it. So, but that is a good point. That is definitely a good point. Okay, there are two more questions, but sure. not regarding this slide. They are Maybe actually, they're asking that. for... I can, uh, I can actually wait for them or I can uh, bring it up and then you decide if you want to answer now. And sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, the first question is that, could increase in the number of infections, oh no, that is that. Do you feel drop in hospitalizations and death can also be contributed to therapeutics such as monoclonal antibodies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, when we're going to talk about it, when we get to treatment, I'll go over all the new treatments that are available. And so, and I'll tell you that 15,000 number that you see here for today, how many people are hospitalized? That number is a definite overestimation. 
Because right now, anyone that enters the hospital immediately gets tested. If they're coming in for a broken arm, they're getting tested for COVID. And guess what? If the COVID is positive, that number goes into that count. So many of those people that are hospitalized right now, they're maybe hospitalized for different reasons. And they're still there increasing that number of hospitalization. But even with that, the numbers are lower than they were a year ago. So, so yeah. And then the treatment modality definitely helps, which we'll go over in a second. And the other question? Uh, there, there are actually a few more. And one of them is that uh, if I got vaccinated with Pfizer in August, which booster should I get? I'm a 42-year-old female. Why don't we do this? Um, if uh, if it doesn't have to do with the slide, I'll just okay. move forward and then we'll answer all of them at the end because those exactly. are all great that questions. I don't, I, wanna, okay. I don't want to rush through it. Yeah, okay. Because I may answer a lot of those questions as I go through my slides too. So vaccines. I think the big question right now is, well, okay. Okay, Dr. Zadeh, I, I agree. Vaccines are protective against hospitalization. They're protective against ICU admissions. They're protective against death. I get it. What are my choices? What are the choices that are available to me? Well, we have three types of vaccines. Uh, only two are actually uh, right now a we are able to use. The, the third one is, is still in the works. One is the mRNA vaccines, and the other one is our vector vaccines. mRNA vaccines are the Moderna and Pfizer. The vector vaccines is Johnson & Johnson. There's AstraZeneca as well, which obviously not available to us here. And then there's the protein subunit vaccine, which is by Novavax, and that's still in the works. That's like a more traditional vaccine. Now, out of all the vaccines, the only one that's FDA approved, fully FDA approved, is the Pfizer. And it's approved for people 16 and over. Pfizer is also emergency use authorization approved for people between five and 15. And within the next week to two weeks, uh, it's going to become EUA approved for people for the kids under five as well. Uh, Moderna at this point is only EUA approved uh, for 18 and over. Why is it not FDA approved? That is a, a very, very good question. I don't know the answer to that question. It should be following Pfizer right behind it. So within a few weeks, it should have been FDA approved. Um, I cannot tell you why it's not FDA approved. Um, Johnson & Johnson is the vector vaccine, and that one is EU approved for people 18 and over. And um, right now, there's a lot of bad publicity by CDC and even World Health Organization regarding Johnson & Johnson. They're really saying that they prefer the mRNA vaccines over the vector vaccines, and they, they prefer Moderna and the Pfizer, ultimately. And uh, we'll go through some of the reasoning why that may be um, in a second. And the reason is because, hey, if you ask me as a doctor, well, are vaccines 100% safe? Well, no. Anything you put through your body, your body can react to it. And that reaction could be a good one that could protect you against the future infection, or it could be a bad one. Let's talk about some of the bad adverse reactions of COVID vaccination. One is anaphylaxis. This we knew from the beginning. And about three out of 1,000 people have this anaphylactic uh, reaction. And uh, of course, it's very dangerous. That's why when we give the vaccine, we always watch the person for about 15, 20 minutes before we let them go. The other one that's a little bit more hidden is the block clot disorders. So what these vaccines seem to be doing is they cause the same problem that some of the COVID infection causes, maybe to a higher amount when you have COVID is that they cause a hypercoagulable state in the body, which means that the blood becomes extra thick in some people. And uh, it causes blood clot disorders. And it's mostly in younger females, and it happens mostly with the vector vaccines. AstraZeneca, much more than Johnson & Johnson, but also happens in Johnson & Johnson. Of course, we don't have AstraZeneca here in the United States yet, uh, and so I, Johnson & Johnson is the one. The other side effect is Guillain-Barré syndrome. This is a form of paralysis that happens. And this happens again with Johnson & Johnson. Again, it's very rare. And uh, the one that's received a lot of publicity lately is the effect of the vaccines on the heart because it does cause some myocarditis and possible pericarditis. And what that word means is the inflammation of the heart. So I kind of wanted to kind of go over that with you because that seems to be one thing that a lot of my patients tell me that's the number one fear they have. They don't, they don't want to have myocarditis when they get the vaccine. And so Israel just completed a study 
uh, five, uh, 5 million individuals that got the vaccine and uh, they had the mRNA vaccine. Out of the 5 million people, only 136 cases of myocarditis were confirmed. And out of those 136 cases, only 95%, I mean, 95% were mild. Only 5% were actually severe enough. And no one really died from it. Eventually it kind of resolved itself, but 5% were severe and 95% were very, very mild. So we're talking about five, six people out of 5 million that had a very severe reaction. Most other people, if they did, it was mild, some chest pain, some, and then it kind of went away on its own. Interesting thing is though, and people use this sometimes as an excuse and says, well, I don't want to get that, so I'm not going to get vaccinated. Well, if you get the COVID infection, the risk of myocarditis is four times as much. So if the vaccine can help you prevent getting an infection, and I'll go over some of the things we can do to help, help prevention of infection, then you have less chance of getting the, the myocarditis than if you actually got the vaccine. Because if you get the infection, you have higher chance of getting that. So myocarditis, not, not, not a big deal, but something that us as providers and patients, they need to be aware of. So if they start feeling symptoms, they go to the provider right away to get treatment. Now, the biggest thing is, if I wanna use a vaccine, I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna get infected. And um, well, how am I gonna do that? We already, Dr. Zadeh's graph that was, he took from the, the Canadian study in the beginning, the chart shows that the effectivity of the, vac of the uh, vaccination against infection drops dramatically with Omicron. Well, there was a CDC study that was just released about five days ago. And uh, it showed that if you have the two vaccines and the booster, that this is actually gonna be 90% effective against hospitalization and 82% effective in, against decreasing a reason to go to ER or an urgent care. That means even if you do get the infection, you're not gonna feel bad enough that you're gonna seek help. And that is a very good reason to get the booster. Now, who is at risk that should get the booster? Really, what this study showed is that people over the age of 50 are the ones that really will benefit from getting that booster, especially if you're overweight and have comorbidities. So if the answer is, should I get the booster? Well, if you're over 50 and you have any kind of comorbidity or if you're younger and you're morbidly obese and you you're, have a lot of extra weight on you, you have diabetic, well, those people have also fall in that category, then definitely get the booster. Well, when can you get the booster? The booster is available to you five months after your last vaccination dose. So you have to wait five months after your second dose of vaccination or the first dose if it's Johnson & Johnson. Or if somehow in the last five months you got an infection with COVID, which is very common now, uh, with Omicron, you have to wait again 90 days before you get the booster. So 90 days after an infection and five months after the second dose of vaccination. And based on this CDC study, this will really protect you. 90% decrease in hospitalization if you get the booster, which is very, very powerful. So just to make sure everyone understands this. So who is the most protected? Because this is the big debate that you always hear. Who is most protected? Well, people that get the infection, is the natural immunity better or is the vaccination better? Well, let me kind of break it down for you based on the studies. If you've had two vaccines and you got the infection, you are the most protected, okay? And that's the sec very close second to that is getting two vaccination and a booster. So two vaccination and a booster, two vaccination and an infection, you're extremely protected. This is the most protection you can get. They actually have a name for this now. They call, they call it super immunity when you actually have a, a two vaccination and you get the infection because you form thousand times the antibodies when that happens. After that, the next level is people that are not vaccinated, but they've had the infection. After that are the individuals that have received two vaccines. But notice here, people with natural immunity actually have better protection. They're more protected than people that have received just two vaccines. So this is a very important thing to, to remember that. And of course, the people that are not 
vaccinated and they have not had the infection, they have the least amount of protection. So what should you do then? Well, number one is if you had the two vaccines and you haven't had an infection, then get the booster. But please don't take this data and say to yourself, well, great, I had two vaccines. Now I'm just going to go and get COVID and I'm going to be super immune and I don't have to worry about anything anymore. Because the reality is, if you get COVID, there are sequela to COVID that are very, very bad. And I'm going to go over those. These are the long haul symptoms that people get after they get COVID. One of the most important ones that's getting a lot of research done on right now is brain fog. People after COVID, many people can't think, can't process things. Um, their, their cognition starts going down. I have had many patients of mine that were brilliant professionals and had to quit their job, completely going to disability after they got the COVID because they could no longer do their job because their job required a very sharp mind and they, they just don't have that anymore. The other one is ongoing shortness of breath. I have tons of patients that even though they had the COVID months ago, they're still coming to me coughing, still short of breath when they try to exert themselves. This is ongoing. Headaches, people that never had really bad headaches and then they got the COVID <clears throat> and now for months after, they still have the headaches, hair loss, depression. They can, people can go into major depression after COVID because they can't get back to their normal life. And so these are things that we don't want. So if you've had two vaccinations, get the booster. You'll get the, almost the same protection as two vaccination and infection minus all of these issues. And that's what we want to work for, okay? So this is kind of my information on basically the vaccination, booster, immunity. Now I'm going to open it up a little bit to the questions regarding vaccination. Uh, Nayajan, if you don't mind, if you have any questions regarding vaccination, please. Bale, doroste. Ma bezeret bagadim be undo to soali ke qablan shode bud ke dar mored vaccination bud. Khanumi soal kardan ke if I got vaccinated with Pfizer in August, which booster should I get? I'm a 42 year old female. Very very good question. So. The research shows that actually mixing vaccines is more effective than if you stick to the same vaccine you had before. So if you have Pfizer, uh, two doses of Pfizer, and now it's time to get a booster, my recommendation is if you can, get the Moderna if it's available. If it's not available, don't just sit there and wait. Get another Pfizer. So if it's available to you, get the Moderna if you've had two Pfizers. If you have two Modernas, Get the Pfizer instead, because each of these vaccines are built, they, they have built immunity against a certain spike proteins, different ones. So if you have a combination of these vaccines, you form more immunity against more spike proteins. And so there's less chance that a variant of COVID can invade your immunity. So that's my recommendation. That's what research shows. And that's what I did for myself. I had two Pfizer vaccines. So when I had my booster, I got Moderna for my booster. So all the has, uh, do you recommend the booster to someone that has been fully vaccinated then got COVID? I think you- That's a great that. question. So if you had two vaccines and had COVID, you will have super immunity right now. You are very well protected. So I would say, I would take that as a case by case. For example, if someone is extremely fragile, if they are very old, if they are very high risk, then I may offer them the booster. The reason is because it will add just extra protection for them. But for most of the people, my recommendation is if you've had two vaccines and an infection, you don't need the booster. Now, I know a lot of guidelines will not agree with me. But I, like I said, this is my personal opinion on this. And it's based on the research I just showed you that people with two vaccination and infection, they have the highest immunity against COVID. And so at that point, why would you get another vaccination, especially if vaccines also have side effects associated with them? Every time you do something to your body, you must weigh risk versus benefits. And if the benefits are less than the risk, then that's something you shouldn't do. As we move toward the Omicron variant, 
the risk of dying is already coming down because of the type of variant Omicron is. On top of that, as you have two vaccines and an infection, you have lots of immunity in your system. So what justifies you getting another booster shot on top of that? Really, it has to be a very, very weak uh, immune system person for me to, to recommend that to them. دو تا سوال هست در رابطه با دث اینسیدنس که من الان میگم حالا فکر میکنم برمیگرده به اون اسلاید اول شما یک سوال میگه که دو وی سی دی سیم ترند نشنالی دا وی سی این کالیفرنیا ایت اپیرز دیلی دث ار هایر دیس ایر سو دیلی دث ار کامینگ داون ایوریور ناو اف کورس ایتس مور دن ایت واز a month ago or a month and a half ago. But compared to a year ago, everywhere in the United States is lower now. And the reason is, even though Omicron, uh, first of all, I'm gonna show you a slide in a second to talk about different variants. The variant right before Omicron was the Delta variant. And the Delta variant was a lot more deadly. And so a lot of people were are dying even today because they got, the the delta variant almost a month ago or a month and a half ago because they got sick they went in the hospital i have a lot of people in my hospital that are on their day 29 day 30 intubated on high flow oxygen they can't get off so uh, i would tell you this that everywhere in the united states you're going to notice a big huge drop in the number of death rates and this is not just happening in the united, united states it's happening around the world and i'll talk about that at the end نمیدونم امیدوارم که این سوال من قبلا برای شما نخونده باشم ولی حالا به سیفتره که بگم دوباره Do you feel drop in hospitalizations and death can also be contributed to therapeutics such as monoclonal antibodies? Absolutely, absolutely and I'm going to go over the treatments in a second so we can go over all of those so that's a very good point یک سوال دیگه ما خیلی سوال داریم how can people share in bathroom and beds have such different outcomes? It's a very good question. So everyone's immune system is very different. There's two types of immune systems. There's the adaptive immune system and there's the innate immune system. Innate immune system is our general immune system that fights against all infections that are out there in the world. Some people have a very strong innate immune system. And so they don't get sick very often. They can, they can be actually, there's actually new studies that even show there are certain genetic predispositions that make individuals immune to COVID. So innate immune system is very important. Now, adaptive immune system is once you get the infection, once the innate immune system fails and you get the infection, then your body produces these T cells and B cells, the memory cells. And then so ultimately, then it becomes you have a second layer of immune system that gets activated specifically for that one antigen or one virus or bacteria that got through. And that's the adaptive immune system. So different people have different abilities on forming that adaptive immune system. For example, if you are 40 years old versus you're 80 years old, well, the 80 year old person may have a much harder time forming an adaptive immune response than a 40 year old. That's why in the old days, when we were used to give flu vaccines, the flu vaccines for the elderly were always a higher concentration of vaccines because they needed more vaccines in order to get the same immune response. Now, that's also true for a husband and wife. There could be a husband and wife that live together and one that gets the disease and, and does very poorly and the other one that gets it and is completely asymptomatic. Again, that's again how their body is reacting to it. So good thing is and bad thing is all of us have such a unique physiology and innate immune system response and adaptive immune response that we all will respond differently to to COVID, not just to COVID, to the influenza to uh any virus that's out there it's just the way it is unfortunately and i have seen it in my own practice there were husband and wives that ultimately got sick and the husband, I thought, was the one that's going to do very poorly because he was morbidly obese, diabetic, with heart disease. And uh, the wife was thin with just diabetes. And guess who did the worst? The wife did the worst. And she's the one that passed away through this uh, process. 
And ultimately what that tells me is we still to this day do not fully understand how our bodies respond to different things that affect us. And the, the way that we trigger, we get triggered and the way we respond physiologically is still a, a science of, uh, that's very unknown to us. So, so I cannot say why exactly husband and wife share the same bed and they have different reactions, but I definitely do see it uh, in my practice that it does happen. Two people in the same house, two people, brother and sister even, complete different response, uh, response to the disease. Okay, we have a few more questions and I would like to read them to you now because sure. I'm afraid to lose, you know, to miss any of them if I want sure. to save on uh, any of them. Anyway, the uh, next question is that for how long to recover patients after their infection are able to transfer virus to others? That's a good question. Up to recently, we used to say 10 days. That is for people that are asymptomatic. So by day 10, you had no symptoms, which by symptoms, I mean, mostly like fever, uh, you know, then at that point, we would say, you don't even need to test anymore. You're cleared and you don't have to quarantine anymore. Well, just recently, CDC changed the guidelines and um, they changed it to five days now. So now it's five days. Everyone feels a little uncomfortable with that five days because we're not really sure uh, even though CDC assures us that there's a lot of research and science behind it, we're not really sure if that's ultimately all that it was involved in making that decision. And the reason I say that is because, as you see right now, we have the highest number of daily cases. We have a lot of people in the hospitals. We have a lot of people in ICUs. And everyone is getting Omicron. I, I, my, my staff always makes fun of me because I keep saying, everyone will get this. If you're vaccinated or not, everyone will get it. Of course, that's, you can't make a general judgment like that, but I'm just trying to exaggerate. Well, imagine if half of the hospital or 20% of the hospital have COVID and we tell every one of those staff members, even if they're asymptomatic, and most of them are gonna be asymptomatic with Omicron, for them to stay home for 10 days, what will happen to the hospital system? It will completely break down. What would happen to government? It will shut down. What would happen to the banks? I mean, every system in the government will most likely shut down. So what I think CDC has done is looked at the data and came up with a compromise and said, well, after five days, you're unlikely to pass the virus. So let's just make that the day because that way people can get back to work faster. And, um, and that's, 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 that's what I still to this day, if I have to be very cautious, I go based on the 10 day rule. So I tell people, yeah, listen, you still should keep separate up to 10 days. Even if you have to go back to work, you need to stay kind of quarantined, you need to wear the N95 mask, and you need to make sure you stay separate from everybody else up to the day 10. At that point, you can go back to normal, whatever normal is for the policy of that office. So okay. 10 days, that's my opinion. Based on CDC though, it's five days. We have a long question from an audience that, I believe uh, he's pretty uh, well aware of healthcare system. So it is a very good question, probably. Uh, does the profit motive of companies like Pfizer, j and and Moderna create a disincentive for the rapid deployment of vaccines in poorer countries, uh, i.e. Uh, does it create uh, perverse incentive for those companies to prolong the pandemic as long as possible? This is one part of the question. Well, I'll tell you, if anyone says absolutely no, then they're not really being honest. And if someone says 100% yes, then they're probably talking and assuming things. Because in reality, we know that everything is to a certain degree run and operated based on monetary benefits. If we want to sit here and say, absolutely that's not happening, I, I would say that we're doing a disservice to the community. To what extent that's happening, that is beyond my pay grade to tell you exactly to what extent is happening, to what extent of delays, to what extent of the force on the mandates to, for people to get vaccinated, even though we now see the Omicron almost completely going away. 
what the boosters now, the mandating, even California is now uh, just put a bill in place that the schools can actually start to vaccinate the kids without parents' permission. So these pushes coming in at the time where we know based on other countries' experiences is toward the end of the pandemic, uh, you know, as I see it, kind of makes you think that there may be some monetary push behind it as well. But again, I don't know this. That's a great question. And whoever's as asking this question obviously is very insightful. Uh, definitely, I think all of us as taxpayers and as people that are consumers of the medical field, we need to be aware that that's a possibility and keep our eyes open, you know. And unfortunately, there's not, not a thing we, we can do of, you know, at this point. Just educate what we can. The second part of the question is uh, different. And uh, it says, have you heard about Corbovax, the open source vaccine, which has no patent, created in Baylor University in Texas. That costs only about uh, $1.5 per dose compared to $20 per dose for the others. How effective is Corbovax? So that's a great question. So no, I haven't heard about the Corbovax and the probably because this doesn't make any money for anyone. So there's not a lot of studies on it. And the fact that I haven't heard from about it is because there are probably no major, uh, large randomized controlled trials on it that uh, we see every day, or the avenues that we choose to get the information from are not sharing it. So yeah, are there probably other vaccines that are just as effective and they're much cheaper and we're not hearing about them? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, that goes along with the other question that someone asked is why is Moderna, for example, not FDA approved? There may be a reason, you know, the same kind of reason behind it, but I'm not going to get involved in the politics of it. I just I agree that there is definitely some things that it's hard to understand why it's happening. So uh, the next question is uh, from someone who is actually referring to your description on immunity. And the question goes, is the order of immunity you mentioned the same for young children? We had COVID two weeks ago and my children were only sick for one day. So, uh, so at this point, I don't think they need the vaccine. Yeah, uh, I, and I 100% and I agree with them in a sense that if they had the infection two weeks ago, for sure they don't need the vaccine now. They have to at least wait 90 days. Even after 90 days, I would be cautious in kids that already had an infection to give them the vaccine. Again, we have to go back to how we did medicine before all this. Before all this, if you would come to me in my office and said, hey, Dr. Zadeh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm immune against the measles. Well, I say, no problem. I'm gonna run a blood test on you. I'm gonna see if you have antibodies against the measles virus. And if you do, I would sign you off that you don't need to get vaccination again. Well. We can do the same now. And I do this for my, my patients right now, even though that's not very publicly or based on the guidelines. But if a kid, after they just had an infection, they have a large amount of antibodies in their system, and I'm sure they will, then they don't need uh, another vaccination uh, at this point. Especially when we see that Omicron variant, as you'll see in a second, is very, is, is, very low in its deadliness. So it's not very deadly. It doesn't cause a lot of hospitalization. It, it's one of his major side effects is not even shortness of breath. So when you see all of this, then you go, well, why are we pushing the kids that just had an infection to get vaccination? And my, my statement is, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't. And again, I'm not a pediatrician, I'm an internist. I'm giving you my opinion as if, if those kids were mine and how I would handle it. If I'm really worried if they're immune or not, I would check in for antibodies. If they show antibodies in the blood and then antibodies are significant enough, I wouldn't do vaccination. And I've done that before. Uh, there are two questions related to the future a little bit, but I'm uh, reading them. So should we anticipate another variant after Omicron? Oh, absolutely. So coronaviruses will, based on their nature, they're gonna continue to mutate and just to, get into that because that's actually what I'm going to talk about now is that look at this graph. This graph looks at the timeline from May of 2020 
to November of 2021. In a year and a half, we've had five major variants. The first one in May of 2020 was the alpha variant, came in from UK. Then in August, we had the beta variant, that's the B1351, that one's the South African uh, variant that came from South Africa. Then in November 2020, we had the Brazilian variant, we call that the gamma variant or the P1 variant. And then recently, we end up with a Delta variant, which was, this was the one that was very, it, it was more contagious and a little bit more deadly. So this is the one that caused a lot of problems in people, especially if they were not vaccinated. People that had vaccination, as you notice in my chart, they were still protected for hospitalization and, uh, and death. And then now we have the B11529 or Omicron variant. So you notice in just a year and a half, we've had five major variants. I'm not including the other 30 variants that are not included in this. So what makes us think that as time goes by, there are not gonna be more and more variants? But the beauty of this is, is once you are exposed to this virus, even if the virus begins to change, there are parts of it that stay the same. So as long as your immune system recognizes those parts, we can fight those infections easier and we will not die from them. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking forward to the point where we're so exposed to all the different variants that at that point, doesn't matter how much it changes, there are still components of the virus that are the same and we are recognizing them and we're able to fight them. But ultimately, there will be many, many more variants. And I'll tell you, my biggest worry is not just COVID-19 uh, you know, that's going to be a variant, but what about virus X that's going to come in the future? In the future, my fear is that we are not going to die from wars. We're not going to die from nuclear bombs. What we're going to die is from little tiny enemies. And those are the viruses. And that's when it, what's going to get us. And I really hope that the government starts recognizing this and putting more effort into preparing for that day, you know, now and not wait till we have another COVID-19 and then try to ramp up the defenses. So instead of putting all the money in military, you know, maybe put more money, you know, push, big portion of that toward this, because that's where the, at least my opinion is that's where the danger comes from. Okay, the next question is that there is a new version of Omicron found in LA. Can you please elaborate on it? So as far as Omicron, we, we, all, all of them are still Omicron. Very difficult to know, um, even if you've had Omicron or not, this is only public health departments can really tell that information. So, so far it's only Omicron. Now I'll show you right now in this next slide, how things have changed in California, LA, everywhere. You notice here, look at this graph on the, on the left side. You see the orange. The orange is the Delta variant. The purple is the Omicron variant. And if you notice that in October 23rd of 2021, and that's just a few months ago, almost the entire variants that were out there were Delta variants. Now you notice that today, look on this side of the graph. It's all purple now. So almost 99.9% .9 of all the variants are now all Omicron. So this is what transition has happened now. And Omicron, if you look at this state by state here, and this is California, obviously, you notice that there's a very, very thin sliver of orange in there. You can barely even see it, which means there's no more Delta variant. And pretty much anyone that gets getting COVID right now, they're getting the Omicron. And that's the ultimate one that we're dealing with. And since we're talking about Omicron, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Number one, Omicron is definitely more contagious. It can evade our immunity and it can infect people that have been vaccinated. So that's like I showed you in the beginning of this talk, the prevention against infection has dropped. So Omicron can really get through the immune system and cause people to get sick. But the vaccinations are still able to protect us against dying and hospitalization. Shorter incubation period, two to three days. What does that mean? That means if I get exposed to Omicron today, my symptoms begin to show in two, three days. This is a good thing, if you believe it or not, because when it came to the previous variants, 
it would take anywhere between five, six days to sometimes 14 days. So there was a time period where people were sick. They were spreading the COVID, but no one knew they were sick because they looked fine. And we found out in the previous one, as I mentioned in my previous talk is, people were actually most contagious the day or two before became, they became symptomatic. Well, in this case, when you get sick, within two, three days, you're showing symptoms. Doesn't leave a lot of room for people to expose each other without knowing. So this is a good thing when it comes to a virus for us to be able to identify who's sick, quickly test them. As you've all mentioned, there's more testing available now. And then, as you've also mentioned, there are now much more treatments that we can use. So we can just get on the ball much quicker. These are all positive things that's going to help us control the, the, the COVID pandemic much easier. Now, I just told you the incubation period is two to three days. So what are the symptoms that you should be watching out for when, if you get Omicron? Well, the top four symptoms are congestion, runny nose, congestion, and sore throat. These are the two things that I hear all the time. Well, you know, I just felt like my throat was hurting and I was really congested. Those are two big signs, headaches and fatigue. The good news is, what are you not seeing in these four symptoms? Cough and shortness of breath. That means Omicron is leaving the lungs to a certain degree. And that is a great thing. That means people may get sick, but they're not gonna die from it. What is this starting to sound like? Fatigue, headache, sore throat, and congestion. The top four symptoms. Sounds like a common cold. And this is great news. That means COVID has gone from the one thing that basically made everyone super sick to now something that's gonna be like almost like a common cold. And that's where the Omicron is. Now, less commonly, we can still get some individuals that can have cough and shortness of breath, but it's very, very much less common fever, chills, and loss of taste and smell. So it still happens, but it's much more rare, okay? So these are all great signs. And once you feel those symptoms, what should you do? You should get tested. What are the tests that are available to us right now? The PCR test is still the gold standard, but good luck finding one because there's a national shortage right now. It's so difficult to find the PCR test. And if it's available, they'll tell you, well, we'll test you today, but you'll get the result in three days. Well, that's useless. If I'm gonna to test today and I have to wait three days to know what my results are, by then either the infection is gone and I've passed it on to many people or I'm in the hospital, you know, because I'm getting worse. So in reality, uh, the other test, which is not as sensitive is the antigen test, but it's much more available. The PCR test can pick up an infection 48 hours before the antigen test does. Because for the antigen test to test positive, you have to have a large amount of viral load in your system before you test positive. For us, it's very important to know that because if you're testing positive with the antigen test, you have a lot of virus in your system. You are very contagious. So this is a good little something to know when you're quarantining people. And when the antigen test becomes negative, that means the viral load has decreased to the point that's not being detected anymore by the antigen test. And that means that you're not as contagious. So you can kind of loosen up your restrictions on yourself. The antigen test is now easily available. PCR test is hard to find. And um, one thing that is very important is if you do get tested for COVID, it's okay. So here's the situation. You, you were exposed. You start noticing congestion and sore throat. And then you got, okay, I got tested and I'm positive. What do I do? Well, the, the great news is the last time I had this talk, I had almost no medications in EUA approved treatments for outpatient. Now I have more, more medications in the outpatient EUA approved uh, area than I do in inpatient. And just so everyone understands, I don't wanna uh, use the words that are, are not commonly used. Outpatient means patients not very sick yet. This is in the clinics. Inpatient is when they're sick enough that they have to be admitted to a hospital, which means now we have tons of things that we can use for people that uh, before they get really sick to hopefully prevent them from ever getting too sick. Number one was monoclonal antibodies. This was a big winner for us, and it truly helped. The Regeneron and uh, the Bamla Viminap and the Etisimab, both of those decreased hospitalization by two and a half, three times. That was great. 
But the key thing for them is they only work for Delta variant and they work for the Alpha variant. Well, I just showed you the map. Out of people getting infected nowadays, are anyone getting the Delta anymore? The answer is no. So really, you shouldn't be getting the Regeneron anymore. Uh, it was great when, when the Delta variant was, was high. Now, they have a new monoclonal antibody, which is the, the Sotrovimab. And the Sotrovimab is specifically for the Omicron. Problem with it is it's not very available everywhere. So you may have to look for it and there's usually in limited amounts. But if you're gonna get a monoclonal at this time, that's the one I recommend. Now, there are more good news. There are pills now that have the EU approval for prevention of hospitalization. There's the Paxlovid and the Molnopiravir. So Molnopiravir decreases hospitalization by 50%. That's amazing. The Paxlovid, decreases hospitalization by 89%. This is fantastic. So if I have a patient that let's say had two vaccines and they got their, they had their booster, then in that case, I'm gonna assume they have enough antibodies in the system. And if they get sick and if they are high risk, I'm gonna put them on Paxlovid because the Paxlovid acts as an antivirus and it can decrease the viral load. And that decreases hospitalization for those patients, which is fantastic. Now, there's also just recently an IV infusion of remdesivir just got approved just a few days ago, four or five days ago, uh, got approved by emergency use authorization to be used for outpatient cases. We used to use remdesivir only in the hospital, but now we use it uh, in-house. In and that seems to do a good job as well in preventing people from going from mild to moderate disease to severe disease that requires hospitalization. And it's three days of IV infusion of remdesivir. So this is great news. Now, your question is, well, do we have anything for prevention of COVID? All of these medications that I just mentioned are medications you give to someone if they have COVID. And you wanna, you're worried about them because you think they're going to go from mild to moderate to severe, end up in the hospital, intubated, or worse. There's an intramuscular uh, treatment by EvoShield. EvoShield, which is the number three on the, on the list here, EvoShield is basically synthetic antibodies that you, it's an injection you can give to patients that are high risk and maybe you, they, they can't get the vaccine and you wanna make sure you give them some protection. So you give them a shot every six months and this generates antibodies in their system. Well, it gives them antibodies in their system that last six months and can protect them in case they get the COVID infection. So how great is this? We have something to give people that can get vaccinated to help them protect them against future infections. We have pills that we can give the people that are have fully vaccinated, but they're still high risk. We have IV monoclonal uh, antibody infusions that we can give to people that are not fully vaccinated. And we have remdesivir that we can give to everyone that's high risk to prevent them from getting into the hospitals. So yes, one of the people that asked the question is, some of the reason why the hospitalization is low, is it because we have better ways of preventing hospitalization? The answer is 100% yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now, there are also medications that are not EU approved, but some physicians are still using it. The top two that I see all the time, and you know, I, I, I wanna just mention them, is ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Now, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, be frank, I'm not going to talk too much about because there have been so many large randomized controlled trials on that, and it showed absolutely no benefits. And the side effects are impaired reaction, double vision, deadly arrhythmias, especially in some patients when they have electrolyte imbalances or they have genetic QT prolongation, which is a genetic uh, heart condition. Uh, it can cause anemias if you have certain uh, deficiencies, like in uh, G6PD deficiencies and it can cause eye damage. Why would you give that to anyone if it has no benefit? It doesn't make sense to me. So I would, if, I, if you're a patient and your physician gives this to you, I would just say, thank you very much and just shred that prescription and put it aside. That's my opinion. Ivermectin, I feel differently about. Ivermectin um, is, a, is a medication that in reality, there was a lot of studies that showed benefits of Ivermectin. Some didn't show any benefits, but didn't show a lot of harm either. And, um, but it never got a full respect that it should have. 
And um, the good news is with ivermectin, there is a study in Duke University that's happening now. It's a large study, 2,500 people, and they are studying ivermectin to finally get an answer that is ivermectin uh, uh, beneficial in prevention of hospitalization or not. And hopefully once we have the answer to that, this could also be a great addition to our, our repertoire of medications that we can use. And uh, the side effects of the ivermectin also, they're not uh, to be taken lightly. It can cause seizure in certain individuals. It's rare, but it can happen. It can cause imbalances in walking, ataxia, weakness, double vision, confusion. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors put the patients automatically on hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin together. So the three days into it, the patient's coming to me and going, doc, I feel terrible. I'm, I'm foggy. I can't walk. Uh, my vision is affected. And my first thing I tell them is stop all those medications, you know, because, you know, the number one thing we learn in medicine, you know, at least uh, I try my best to do is do no harm. And if I'm not doing any benefit uh, for a medication, I won't give it. Now, ivermectin, I have given it in the past. Uh, because some of the studies show positive result, it's not EU approved. So when I did use it in the past, it was off label, but I don't use it frequently. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, I did use it in the beginning when it was EU approved. And when it stopped being EU approved after all the studies came out, I stopped using it completely. There's another medication called the fluvaxamine. And fluvaxamine is just a medication for obsessive compulsive disorder. And it has shown some potential positive benefits as well. This is another medication that's being studied in that Duke University with the 2,500 people. So hopefully we're going to get some good results on this and the ivermectin, and that'll be great addition to the things that we already have. This is all for outpatient. Now look for inpatient. You see we have nothing. For inpatient, we have remdesivir. It really reduces hospitalization by a little. Uh, we have tocilizumab and uh, the baricitinab that reduce inflammation, but they work again very little. And then we use dexamethasone or other steroids and that seemed to help at times. But I will be honest, once the patient is that sick and they're in the hospital, I've thrown every one of these medications at them and rarely, rarely I get them to respond back and you know, get better. So if they're to the point that they're intubated at that point, None of these medications work. So where, where, where can, where is the best, where we have the biggest benefit? Catching these things early, catching it when it's still mild, catching it when it's mild to moderate, immediately seeing your physician so they can start those outpatient therapies that we know based on studies work. So that way you never get to the point where you're in the hospital on a BiPAP, high flow oxygen or intubated. That is my number one advice to you all. Don't get to this point because at that point, I do everything I can for you. What I'll tell you is usually very little and uh, I haven't seen much benefits. So before I go on to the future, are there any more questions on the, on the part we just talked about? Uh, yes, there are actually a few more questions. Uh, one question goes back to sequela's effect. And someone asked, does it take a long time to recover from the COVID sequelas you mentioned? Yeah. In some individuals, it may take weeks. <clears throat> In some individuals, it may take months. In some individuals, I still haven't seen it be improved. So it very much varies. Um, most of the times, the sense of taste or smell usually comes back. The headaches usually go away af after weeks. Shortness of breath usually resolves after mostly a few months. But the brain fogginess sometimes can stay permanently. And there are now uh, undergoing studies on this to figure out what's happening. And they've even found that when they take this spinal fluid off the people with the brain fogginess after a COVID infection, that even the spinal fluid has changed. So there are permanent changes that happens to your brain after you get the COVID infection. So some of those uh, sequelas, they can last a lifetime, unfortunately. And um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, with your permission, actually, I have a comment on that because I read something about it on, in Nature Brief this morning. This is a report that has just uh, released this morning, and they said that the sequelas, the effect of sequelas is much less on those patients who, uh, who have been vaccinated. 
So vaccinated actually prevents that. You know, when you're vaccinated, you just don't get as many symptoms. I have a lot of patients that are older, high risk. They're fully vaccinated and they're like, doc, I don't even know I'm positive. I mean, I'm testing positive, but I have no, no symptoms. And of course, if you don't start with any symptoms, you don't end up with any sequela. Most of these people that have sequelas, when they got sick, they got very sick. They had the brain fogginess while they were sick and then it lingered. They had the shortness of breath while they were sick and it lingered. They had the headaches while they were sick and it lingered. So in reality is if you're vaccinated, you're not gonna be asymptomatic. And if you're not asymptomatic, you're most likely not gonna have those sequelas. So again, I much rather get vaccinated than get an infection. At least get vaccinated before you get an infection if you're gonna get one. So, because that way you don't have the symptoms. Uh, yeah, there is a question. Um, re- uh, well, I can't really, okay. It says eventually SARS-CoV-2 will become endemic. What infection rate would you consider low enough that society can go back to normal? So the, the infection rates that we all look at is an infection rate of less than 1.0, right? So for example, in UK and Israel now, the infection rate is about 0.7. When the infection rate is less than 1.0, that means as time goes by, the infection is going to start going lower and lower and lower, and it goes down. When the infection rate is higher than 1.0, at that point means as time goes by, the infection rate is going to keep going up and up and up. So what we're looking for is an infection rate of less than one. When that happens, and we get to UK and Israel's point, uh, right now in Israel, the number of infections per day are 20. 20 infections per day. And so this is going to happen to us. Uh, it would have happened earlier if we were more vaccinated. But it's happening later to us because, again, because of the pol- politicizing and the political parts of the vaccination, many people don't believe that vaccines are, are good. And, and they do believe that there are microchips in the vaccines still to this day. They believe that it causes miscarriages. Uh, they believe that uh, it's, and I, I'm not saying vaccines are 100% safe, but I'm saying that for a vaccine, uh, any vaccine that we've received in the past, actually COVID vaccines are relatively safe. So, so I would say, uh, you know, definitely we are eventually going to get there because all the individuals that didn't have the vaccines, eventually they're going to get the COVID uh, because the COVID, the Omicron variant is very contagious. And so we will get it. And one of the reasons it's very contagious is the other COVID viruses used to not to stick to surfaces. But Omicron has been found to stick to surfaces much longer. So clothes, surfaces on the uh, you know, uh, tables and other things. And they believe this is one of the main reasons why Omicron is so contagious because someone can touch something and an hour or two later, someone else can touch it and they can get the virus from that. And that didn't happen before. And now it's happening. Uh, the next question goes, uh, do you foresee any health issues for a child that has been fully vaccinated then got COVID? You know, the chances and the probability of something bad happen to a child, even without vaccination, is extremely low. Now, once you're vaccinated, that risk even gets lower. Will the risk ever be zero? No, but it will be very close to zero. My two daughters just recently had COVID. And, uh, you know, I, I was not, I was, of course, concerned, but I knew they're going to do fine. And of course, my children were not the age to get vaccinated, you know. So I would tell you this, that once they have an, uh, they've had the vaccination, even if they get COVID, the risk of the symptoms is going to be very, very low, most likely. Could it be that one in a million that has a horrible negative uh, outcome? It's possible. But also it's possible that when you drive in your car, you're going to get in a car accident. We still get in our cars and we still go driving and we still do the things that we got to do. But the risk is going to be much, much lower. Uh, There's a question uh, very, very specific to someone who apparently has uh, long COVID. Uh, It says, my headaches haven't gone away and MRI showed um, IIH fluid in the spine and brain. The neurologist thinks it might be long COVID. Uh, Is that possible? 
had two lumbar puncture were done and now he has he has me on my migraine pill absolutely is possible i've seen it in my practice as well that's one of the reasons that i mentioned that a headache has one of the long haul sequelas and these headaches are not like a normal headache these are debilitating headaches so i'm sorry for the individual that's having suffering from that you know and uh, and i hope it's temporary and transient and eventually will go away but uh, again, I've had patients that that hasn't gone away for them. And it continues that ever since I had COVID, my mouth has been very dry. When will this get better? <laughs> again, that's, a, that's unfortunately that is one weird. of those things that we don't know. And some individuals, it happens only during the time when they have COVID. When I had the COVID infection, and unfortunately I didn't get it too, I was, my mouth was very, very dry. And so, and actually, uh, it went away. Um, but in some individuals, it doesn't go away for a long time. So I would say, you know what? It's just, uh, it's we're in that unknown territory. Because remember, the entire pandemic is only two years old. And some of these infections are happening so recently, we haven't had enough time to tell you exactly, well, after five years, it's going to go away. Or after three years, it's going to go away. Because we haven't had that much time yet uh, with COVID. So I just pray that all the individuals that have those sequelas with COVID, that they will get better. But I, to answer all of your questions at the same time is, I can, we cannot say when it will go away. Um, so, and there's not a lot, there's not a treatment for it. Uh, you know, it's not like we can give you A, B, and C and say, that's gonna help you. Well, thank you. All of the questions have been answered now, but I just wanted to mention that uh, you have got many thank you messages. Oh, Everybody is very happy and you know they oh, think that it was very informative. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Well, let me just do my last couple of slides for you guys. So what does the future look like? Let's talk about something positive. First of all, as long as we all get vaccinated, even if we get Omicron variant, we're gonna be very immune. So one of two ways, either two vaccines and a booster, two vaccines and an infection, or two vaccines, booster, and an infection how a way that happens, we're gonna become very immune. And that's gonna be great because we're gonna have very low hospitalization rates, very low ICU and very low death rates. Can it still happen? Yeah, of course it can happen. Anything can happen. People die from common cold at times, but it's very, very rare. What's gonna happen with masks and vaccinations? You know, we have all these mandates that are happening right now with vaccinations and the, and the mask and people are tired of it. Well, the good news is that as the Omicron continues to be the dominant variant, as I mentioned to you, the four most common si symptoms of it are congestion, sore throat, you know, headache. Um, these are not things that are deadly. So eventually the risk starts to come down. As the risk becomes, becomes lower, there's not going to be that need to that you have to wear a mask all the time. There's not gonna be that need that you're gonna to have to force everyone, force them to get the vaccine. You know, have a mandate for the healthcare workers. I have a mandate for the government workers. You know, you don't have to do those things anymore. And um, masks most likely will become optional. And it should be at some, soon enough, it should be that because really at some point we should always wear a mask if we're sick because that's what the masks do. They prevent the spit from, from going out. And really they don't prevent us from anything from aerosolized viruses. So in reality, once the Omicron is taken over and there's no other deadly variants coming through because we're getting better at fighting against this virus, then masks should slowly come off. And herd immunity, which was a notion we had in the beginning is unlikely. We're never gonna have herd immunity. We're never gonna get rid of COVID. I think everyone needs to understand that COVID is here to stay. It will just change clothes. It'll go from the Delta to the Omicron, you know, and that's what's going to happen. But as long as we have all been exposed to it, then eventually it goes from a pandemic virus, as you had mentioned, like John, in the beginning, which is a virus where it's not novel to us. That means we, we have never seen it before. So our bodies don't know how to deal with it to a virus that's an endemic virus, which is a virus that's very known to us and we know how to fight it like a common cold coronavirus is that we've been fighting for a long time. And when that happens, we go back to normal. And I foresee that's gonna happen in a very near future. It could happen as early as a month from now. 
uh, you know, this is happening in all the other countries. If you notice, UK just removed all the mask and vaccination mandates. Israel, same thing. They started to ease all the restrictions. Denmark lifted all the COVID restrictions. Singapore is easing all the restrictions. Thailand is easing restrictions. South Africa is easing restrictions. Chile has started to ease restrictions. And many more countries are going to join. So eventually, we're all going to go back to normal. We're going to go to the point where we can hug each other again. We can shake hands again without feeling awkward. We can sneeze without pre pretending like, uh, you know, uh, we, that we're not sneezing or trying to hold it so that, you know, we don't offend anyone. We're going to go back to normal. So I truly believe that that future does look bright. And uh, um, all I say to you all as my final message is, I don't care if we're dealing with COVID. I don't care if you're dealing with COVID-19, COVID-20, uh, virus X. There are certain basic things that if you do, you will do well or better against those viruses. Keep your weight down. Exercise daily. Eat a good nutritious meal. Sleep well. Reduce stress in your life. And if you can do those things and take care of your body, keep yourself healthy, doesn't matter what virus in the future shows up, you will have a better chance of fighting it and doing well with it than someone that doesn't. And COVID-19 has proven that to all of us. And so I just urge you to, instead of focusing now on COVID, start focusing on yourselves and try to make yourselves better. It's a January, beginning of 2022. Make this a year of, for, for your health. And the God willing, doesn't matter what kind of virus comes next, you'll be better prepared for it. Uh, that's the end of my uh, talk. And I open it now to questions if anyone has questions. Uh, well, fortunately, you have answered all the questions throughout the way. We have just only one question left, and the rest of them are just thank you messages oh, that nice. everybody loves you. Some even say that you are their favorite doctor. So, <laughs> and that would not be any surprise to me. That, would, that wouldn't be a surprise to me at all. Um, so the question is, if I just had COVID and I'm 35, should I get the booster in 90 days to, to prevent any future side effects from a future variant of COVID? So here's my recommendation for them is uh, wait 90 days. Let's see how, where we are in 90 days. What if in 90 days, COVID becomes almost zero? What if during that time, the number of daily cases, just like Israel, is 20 cases per day? Well, at that time, would I recommend you to get a vaccine that could potentially have side effects where there's only 20 people getting sick every day in an entire country? The answer is would be no, I wouldn't recommend at that point. So I would say, don't make any decisions yet. You've had the infection, wait the 90 days. At the end of 90 days, sit down with your physician and talk about risk versus benefits and have that candid talk. And at that point, you can make a good decision for yourself based on your risks, the amount of COVID out there, and the risk of the vaccinations. That's my recommendation. Great. I really wish that as you predicted, we soon get over with COVID and the next uh, invitation would be in person that we are inviting you to San Diego, joining us in the group I would love at to. AIP. And now that you are a member, you're really more than welcome. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it's an honor and it's been a pleasure. And I, I really do hope that whatever I said helped and kind of cleared some of the, some of the confusion out there. And uh, I'm always at your service. If you, uh, on my Facebook, if you have any questions, you can always uh, uh, direct message me and I'm very quick on answering everyone's questions. Well, thank you very much. There is another question. I mean, the last thing that I, sure. I'm not sure if this is a, yeah. Are we going to a uh, horror shot? The fourth shot? Oh, that's the fourth. That is, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it is was actually just a recent study telling. done that actually said that the fourth shot of the vaccine does not add any benefits. So as of today, the answer to that question is a definite no. Okay. That's great. And with 
that I think uh, we are done. I just need to thank uh, our technical group who have been helping us at Zoom and Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook. And uh, I should apologize for those uh, non-speaking Farsi audiences that I did not realize that we had this year, I mean, this night we had many uh, non-speaking Farsi audiences and uh, I just mix Farsi and English. So sorry for that. Oh, thank you so much, Nigel. Thank you, Negar. And I appreciate everyone behind this. And thanks, Jonathan Robles, for helping me as well here on this site. And uh, look forward to meeting you all soon in person. Yes. And shaking your hands and maybe giving <laughs> you a hug. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zadeh. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.